yeah, should we go go on with the next talk? We actually have more DSP related content for you tonight. Yeah, not not nearly as uh, complex as Matt, but uh, I thought I'd have a thought I'd have a little stab at it tonight. See what we could do. So um, yeah, I don't think we need to do an introduction or anything. I'll go ahead and share my screen. So this is a uh, this is a talk more for uh, people like myself that are just really kind of starting out. We're on a um, that we're on. We're just kind of getting our feet wet with juice and with DSP and with C++. And so I thought I'd make a talk that's an introduction to the juice DSP module. So uh, can everybody see my screen? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay, great. So this is, so this is just a brief introduction to the juice DSP module. And uh, as you may know, or may not know, juice six was released recently, I think uh, about a month, month and a half ago. And so I thought that it might be nice to give a talk on some of the things that are new in the DSP module and a little bit about how to use it. So here's an outline of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to give an overview of the Juice DSP module. And in the Juice DSP module, you have widgets and you have processors. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the, difference between, the differences between those two. And then I'm going to show you uh, just a very quick overview of how you would make a quick widget and another one where you would make a very simple uh, processor. And then we're going to have a Q&A. So this is more almost of a lightning talk. Shouldn't take very long. So what is the Juice DSP module? So the DSP module is a way that uh, we're able to create abstractions um, very quickly. So rather than having to write a delay or a chorus or uh, a filter on your own from scratch, which would take a very long time, especially if you're just learning, uh, the Juice uh, team and some other people such as Ivan Cohen, who's a DSP engineer over in France, have taken the time to actually write some of these abstractions for you, some of these algorithms, so you don't have to start from scratch. And you can actually take these and you can, uh, they're little blocks, they're almost like blocks of code, and you can take them and you can actually put them together quite quickly. So this concept was originally introduced in 2018. And of course, there are other libraries that are out there that uh, do the same sort of concept, such as Maximilian. And uh, in the Juice 6 release, uh, there have been various improvements to the original DSP module, uh, one of which off the top of my head was that in the original module, you had to, you used to have to use what's called a process duplicator to duplicate the DSP process manually for each channel of audio that you have. And for these new algorithms, you don't have to use the process duplicator anymore. And as I said before, the, the module consists of processors and widgets. And if you'd like to have a look at the juice example, the official juice example, which is written very well, and it shows you pretty much all of the DSP, uh, all the DSP blocks that are available to you, you can actually check it out. If you have juice downloaded, you can just check out in the plugins folder. There's one called DSP module plugin demo, and that has all of the algorithms and you can just switch in between them and try them out. So uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to pick out just two of them and just break them down and show you just the workflow of those. So as I said before, you have these two types of uh, blocks of code in, uh, in the DSP module. You have the processors, which uh, are, are essentially like small blocks of code. You can't really use them on their own. They have to use, be used in tandem with other DSP effects or with other uh, algorithms in order to actually create a whole effect. And then you have what are called widgets and widgets are kind of self-contained uh, DSP um, uh, algorithms that you can actually use on their own and actually build a, a simple plugin just from using these widgets. And so what's the first thing you need to do in order to actually be able to start using this? So the first thing that you need to do is of course, download Juice if you don't have it. So for people that don't know, Juice is a cross-platform C++ library for creating audio plugins and apps. So cross-platform means that you can write uh, for Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android 
from one code base and deploy to all those different platforms. And it's a very powerful tool. So once you have Juice downloaded, in order to actually start using the Juice DSP module, you actually have to add the module. So uh, what you see here is your producer in front of you. And what you would do is you would click the plus uh, symbol there that you see uh, down in the bottom left-hand corner. Then you, do, then you just click add a module and then you can go to the Juice modules path and you just add the Juice DSP module to your modules. And those are kind of like your toolboxes that you're using to actually create your code. So what we're gonna do really quick is we're gonna go through a widget overview of, uh, of a chorus plugin. So this is a very simple chorus plugin and this is a, a great way to show you the workflow of how you would use one of these widgets to actually create something that you could actually load up in your DAW and use as a DSP effect. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to go to your header file and you actually just need to instantiate a chorus ob DSP object and that's how you would do it. So you would use juice DSP chorus and then you could use uh, either float or you could use double precision uh, audio and then you just declare create an object there. From there, you have to uh, you have a function that's called prepare to play, which is a function that calls when you're about to start playing the audio. So it just ensures everything's in the right place. All of your DSP algorithms have been reset and uh, back to there's no kind of junk audio kind of hanging around in your uh, in your buffers and that it ensures that you're clean and ready to go. So to start off uh, at the top, the, you have a uh, object called a spec, a process spec that needs to be instantiated. So the spec is a way that you can uh, let your DSP algorithms know uh, what sort of buffer size you're dealing with and what sort of sample rate that you're dealing with. Okay, so uh, by sample rate, what I mean is that uh, if, you're, if you're calculating at 44,100 samples per second, uh, your DSP algorithm is going to have to process that amount of audio versus if it has to calculate at 48,000 um, samples per second. Okay, and that's uh, that's what's so important for those for these DSP processes to know. They have to know how many samples that you have to actually calculate a second. From there, we just pass that spec object into our chorus object that we created. And then we just reset it, make sure that there's no junk audio in our, uh, in our buffer. Also, we have uh, these parameters that we can create. So uh, you can find all of this, uh, what sort of uh, parameters in these DSP widgets that are available to you just by looking at the Juice API that's on juice.com. And so you can see here that we have some very basic functions that we can call. So we have uh, one called set rate, we have a depth, center delay, feedback, and set mix. So the way that you would normally do this is you would create a slider or a dial for each one of these, then you would attach it normally using an audio processor value tree state, okay? Uh, which is something that is beyond the scope of this particular talk, but you can actually find tutorials on this on uh, this channel. So once you've once you've created your parameters, you've hooked them up to your dials, uh, you've set the values of what your minimum and maximum of each one of these parameters are, then you're ready to go. And another thing is that you can also click into these functions and normally there will be uh, some sort of hint about what sort of minimum and maximum that, uh, what sort of values that, you're, that these uh, functions are expecting. From there, we're ready to go to our process block. So for people that aren't familiar, the process block is where your audio is actually processing your input and output. So it's the main guts of the audio for your plugin. So what we have is we have an audio buffer, which is responsible for outputting uh, the, the audio. So that's kind of like your train where you're actually taking audio and you're bringing it through. And what you're doing here is we're actually creating a sample block, which is a reference to our buffer. And then what we're doing is we're, we're processing the audio through, uh, through this chorus effect. So when it says chorus.process and it has process context replacing, what that means is that all of your audio is being processed through uh, this chorus 
plugin and that is actually replacing what's in your buffer and that's what you're hearing through the output. So that's a uh, that's how a widget works. And now I'm going to show you a little overview of how a processor works. So as I've said before, widgets are more kind of self-contained uh, DSP blocks where you are able to kind of create a plugin just using that one uh, object. With a processor, it's a little bit more complex in that you have to use a couple of these together with each other. So they're smaller blocks and you actually combine these to make uh, a bigger um, a bigger abstraction. So for this one, we're going to use three processors. We're going to use the delay line, we're going to use the linear interpolator, and a dry wet mixer uh, processor. So now we're going to instantiate these objects. And as you can see here, we have an effect. Uh, we have this um, we we have this Const expert called effect delay samples is at uh, 192,000 uh, samples. Okay, so you may be asking why 192,000 uh, samples. Uh, well, the reason is because if our max uh, audio sample rate is uh, 192,000, uh, 192, I think that's what it is, then what we need to do is we need that accounts for one second of audio. So uh, most sound cards, the max sample rate is 192,000. And so 192,000 is uh, the, the uh, accounts for one second of audio. And that's where we're going to store our actual delay samples. So then what we're doing is we're instantiating these delay lines uh, with, uh, with the um, effect delay samples and then we are instantiating our dry wet mixer. So that's just going to be where we're gonna have dry signals coming in and then we're going to use the mixer to actually mix it with the wet signal. Then we're creating these arrays that are going to kind of hold our, uh, our delay values. So the reason that we're using an array of two is because we have a stereo signal, we have two speakers, and then we have feedback if we want to take the uh, if we want to take the feedback and we want to feed it, feed it back into the delay so we hear more than one delay. And then we have a volume control that's going to control how loud the volume is going to be of that feedback. Then once again, we're back to prepare to play. Once again, prepare to play is where uh, when your audio is getting ready to start playing. So when you're about to start processing audio through your plugin, prepare to play calls. And this just ensures once again that all of your DSP algorithms are cleared out, they're ready to go. And we have that DSP proce process spec object that we have to create again, because we need all of our DSP algorithms to know uh, how uh, what our sample rate is that we're operating at. Then we have our parameters. So in this case, we have three parameters that we're working with. We have a rate parameter uh, that defines what the delay rate is going to be. We have the mix, uh, which is going to mix between our dry and wet signal, and then our feedback, which is going to define how long uh, our feedback, the feedback of our delay is going to be. So now here's our process block, and I had to divide this up over two slides. And uh, so what we see is that we are getting, we're creating this audio block reference, which is a reference to our main buffer. Uh, and what it's doing is we have that zero, which is the start channel. And then we're, uh, we're doing the number of channels that's in our audio, which is going to be two. And then uh, once again, we're doing the DSP process context replacing, which means that we are replacing the incoming signal with whatever we get from our outcoming signal. Then before we start actually processing the, the delay, we want to take the signal before we put it into the, the delay, we want to actually uh, push it into our mixer so that we have, we are able to mix between a wet and a dry signal. From here, this is uh, a little bit more complex if uh, I know it is for me, but this is essentially a, a simple feedback delay. So we're going through the channels and what we're doing is we're getting a pointer to our incoming samples and also to our, out, our outgoing samples. And then 
what we're doing is we have this, uh, this variable called last delay output, which is essentially, if we go all the way down to the end of our for loop, uh, we can see that what we're doing is we're just delaying, we're just using that signal to feed it back into the very beginning of the for loop. Uh, and this is what gives us our feedback uh, down. Uh, then we have our linear, uh, we're using our linear, um, uh, linear interpolation to actually, uh, where we're pushing our samples into, um, we're pushing each one of these samples into our linear interpolation and we're setting the, the delay, which is going to uh, give us how far apart each one of these delays is gonna be. And then we're using that to feed it back into itself. And then at the very end of the process block, we are mixing that with uh, the dry signals that we pushed in at the very beginning of, uh, before we went into that uh, double for loop. Uh, so we have our dry signals that we push in and then we're mixing it with the wet samples that we're getting from this delay. So that's the end of the talk. So I hope that uh, that helped give you an introduction to the, uh, to the Juice DSP module. And here are some resources for you if you have some more questions about these. So uh, of course you have the Juice forum that you go to, you could ask these questions. Uh, there are a lot of different discussions. So uh, if you have a question or you run into a particular problem with uh, with using this, you can actually go to the forum. And normally there will be somebody that's asked a question before if it's something that's particularly difficult. Uh, also be sure to check out the Juice example, which is once again, the DSP module plugin demo. Uh, you can go to our Discord community and you can find that on the audioprogrammer.com forward slash community. And I've also created a GitHub repository for both of these plugins for you to check them out. So I've done my best to make these as simple as possible so you can pick them apart and uh, you can find those here. And I'll make sure that I have these slides available in the description after the talk. Great. So anybody got any questions? Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, so that was a great introduction. It's actually surprisingly easy to put together a plugin. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have someone, uh, uh, Joaquin saying basically, please uh, put more videos up on your Juice 6, about Juice 6 on your channel. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm also really looking forward to that. But we also have a couple of questions. So um, Yuppie Cole is asking, if you wanted to create an effect that kind of fully shut off and turn back on, um, mm -hmm. like a reset buffer, every time a note was played, what would be the best way to do that to avoid clicks? So, so ask that, ask that again. So, so my understanding of the question is that if you wanted to have something where you press a note and it turns something on and you let the note go and it just shuts it off again. Yeah. So you can do that with, um, if you want to avoid clicks. Yeah. So it sounds to me like, uh, depending on what it is. So it sounds to me like there needs to be something that's, uh, that's mapped to MIDI events. So you have, when you're pressing a key, you're going to have a MIDI buffer that's happening in your process block. And so what you need to do is you need to detect when that's actually happening um, to trigger an event. Maybe it's a Boolean flag um, to actually be able to make sure that a click isn't happening. So clicks normally happen for one of two reasons, either that the audio has stopped and it's in the middle of a wave and it's not, um, so basically your, the waveform is giving you instructions on how your speakers need to move forward and backwards. So ideally what you want to happen is that you're, you want your audio to stop when the speaker is in the center position. Um, and if it stops, if it stops when it's in the middle of a wave cycle, then that's when you're going to hear the click. So sometimes that happens. Uh, uh, for that reason, another reason why you may hear clicking is that uh, a lot of people uh, uh, forget that they need to normally create a DSP process for each channel of audio that they are actually processing. So, uh, so if you have two uh, channels of audio, like a stereo system, normally uh, not, not really counting what's happening in this Juice DSP module, but normally you have to have, if you have, if you're doing filtering, you have to have two filters, one for the left channel, one for the right channel, and those need to be processing the audio 
independently of each other. So, uh, so you need to make sure that that's happening. But uh, what you would need to do is you would need to find a way to kind of tail off that audio. Maybe, um, I don't know if somebody, somebody else probably has a better, uh, a more technical suggestion on here on, on this, but you would need to somehow maybe crossfade the audio um, to, to make sure that it actually uh, approaches kind of a zero crossing point rather than ending in the middle of a, of a wave cycle. Yeah, so I don't know if G6 has like a new way of doing this, but from what I remember, you had like, there was this um, linear smooth value which lets you create a ramp and then you kind of just multiply that with your signal. Yeah. And playing until it reached zero, basically, instead of just cutting it off. I think that would be one way of doing it. There's like multiple other ways of doing it. I think it kind of really depends on what's, what's going on. Great. Um, right, so there's, there's a few more questions actually. So Atsushi Eno asked, Hopefully that's a general question, but is it safe to assume, and I guess that's actually a question more for the juice team than it is for you. Mm. But the question is, is it safe to assume that those parameter names and those DSP classes don't change in future versions? I mean, I would imagine so. You wouldn't want, I mean, that would be a question more for the juice team, but I know that the juice team does its best to make sure that it doesn't do any sort of breaking changes. And even with this DSP module, there have been new algorithms that have actually been rewritten, but they've still kept some of the old ones just to ensure that there are no breaking changes for people that may have used the previous version. So I can't picture a situation where they would they would uh, intentionally go and break that and uh, and make it different than what it is right now. Yeah, that's my impression as well. Um, so yeah, let's hope let's hope that's the case. So Binder News asks, should you use float or double for samples? Well, this is an this is a discussion that I hear people talking about. Uh, some people actually claim to be able to tell the difference between uh, a floating floating samples and double. Uh, I mean, I I can't. Uh, I don't know anybody that that does and i think most daws actually do just floating point uh processing i don't uh i'm pretty sure that all major daws do floating point processing and not double i may be wrong about that though so i reserve the right to be wrong <laughs> all right and um that's maybe so roberto is asking actually that's something that we could just say to everyone whether this video is going to be uploaded on this channel or whether it will be deleted after it's has been live. Uh, yes, so so all of these videos will be uploaded to the channel afterwards. Uh, so what I'll do over the next couple of days is I'll actually separate these out and provide any resources uh, for the talk, so slides uh, or links that people want to share. And so you will have the live stream, this full live stream, and you'll also have the video separated out. All right. And I imagine that with the... Um... With the other issue with the fading out, it's actually someone mentioned an ADSR curve there on the chat, which is, you know, kind of the next thing you would do. So I guess yeah. you have tutorials about this kind of stuff on your website, don't you? Yep, yep. We have a juice tutorial. We have a tutorial on the ADSR object and how to implement that for sure. That's great. So yeah, I guess that's an amazing resource if you want to know more about this. 